After the massive success of Marvel's Spider-Man, it was obvious that Insomniac would want to follow up with a sequel, but what wasn't as expected was the development of a sort of mid-cool to launch simultaneously with the PS5, Spider-Man Miles Morales. And though the game is quite a bit shorter than its predecessor, it's once again a perfect Spider-Man story, letting us experience Miles' first major outing as Spider-Man and setting the stage for the sequel. Spider-Man Miles Morales might not be as robust as Insomniac's first Spidey game, but it packs a massive emotional punch and gives us a more intimate, street-level experience as Spidey learns the ropes. I've been a fan of Miles Morales for a while, especially after Into the Spider-Verse, and while I was excited for Insomniac's take on the character, I didn't expect them to deliver such a satisfyingly different take on the character than what we had already gotten. I didn't expect to love aspects of Miles' Insomniac story even more than Peter's Insomniac story, and I didn't expect to fall in love with a whole new version of the character that made me feel even more hyped for the full sequel than I already was. It might venom shock you to learn that I adore Spider-Man Miles Morales, and today, I'm going to tell you exactly why. Hey, if you haven't seen it yet, make sure to check out my video on Marvel's Spider-Man before you watch this one. And if you're jonesing for more after that, swing through and check out my Spider-Man retrospectives on the various animated series or my videos on the Spider-Verse films. If you couldn't tell, I really love Spider-Man. Thanks. So after the first game, Insomniac pretty much immediately began work on a follow-up. But with the dev time it would take to properly elevate the sequel, they also began to work on a bit of an expansion game, a mid -quel, built on the skeleton of the first game, meant to showcase the first real steps in my Miles journey as Spider-Man. Personally, I could not be happier about this decision. I understand how some people look at the limited amount of content compared to the first game and are disappointed, but for me, I'd love to see one of these mid between every main entry Spider-Man game. Retailing at a lower price point and giving us a satisfying, impactful story that directly builds on the previous games and sets up for the sequel? Yes, please. I'm obviously stoked for the ways the world and gameplay are going to expand in Spider-Man 2, but I'm mostly here for amazing Spider-Man stories and experiences. If you can give me more great stories that stand on the shoulders of the world and game design of the previous entry, I will take that every single time. Plus, I don't really want to wait five years for every Spider-Man game experience. As I mentioned in my video about the first game, I really love the way they adapted Miles' origin for the Insomniac-verse. I think it elevates the character over the source material while also deftly adapting Miles to this world specifically. Showing Jeff's death as Miles' Uncle Ben moment, and then having both Spidey and Pete step in in different areas of Miles' life to help fill that mentor role just really worked for me. It's such a satisfying slow build throughout the first game, and when that post credit scene hits, it really hits. The DLC for the first game actually also expands on the transition period a bit. As Peter Peter is dealing with Black Cat, Hammerhead, and other threats, there are a handful of phone calls with Miles that show Peter's reluctance to train him. It's fun to see how, even though Peter started being Spidey at age 15, he sees the risks differently now that he's looking at it from adulthood. But it's really satisfying to see Miles win Peter over with his enthusiasm and eagerness to help people, ending in a pretty great final scene that leads perfectly into this game. Ready? I think the web shooters are a little tight. Get used to it. Just try to keep up. It's a really perfect ending beat, showing Peter's encouragement and confidence in Miles as he takes his first leap of faith. Spider-Man Miles Morales takes place about a year after the end of the first game's DLC, and not only do we see that year-long development of Miles' Spidey training, but a ton of other well-woven plot points that effectively build from the previous game. While we know Miles and his family are from Brooklyn, this game actually sees them move to Harlem. I think, functionally, this was because Brooklyn was not available in the New York City map from the first game, but I also think it ties really well into this narrative. After after Jeff's death, it makes sense that the Moraleses may need to find a new place to live. And I also love the way they tie it into this story, explaining that Rio grew up in Harlem and one of the reasons she's returning to her mother's old apartment is to run for a city council seat. And this connects beautifully to what I actually love the most about this game, the sense of community. Spider-Man Miles Morales is your quintessential friendly neighborhood Spider-Man game. While I love the first one, the massive scale and citywide issues can make it start to feel a bit less friendly neighborhood and a bit more spider cop. This is not the case this time. The dilemma being focused into one neighborhood actually really benefits not only the game's themes, but the sense that you are actually helping real people. People in the neighborhood that Miles sees every single day. And this is forecasted brilliantly in the opening sequence of the game, with Miles walking up from the subway into his new neighborhood for presumably the first time as a resident. The neighborhood itself looks beautiful from ground level, but it also immediately shows Miles becoming acquainted with his neighbors, helping some 
someone move a couch onto a truck, complimenting the giant Spidey mural that the local artists are painting. It's a great juxtaposition from Peter's opening in the first game, as he's a bit isolated at that point in his life and Spidey career. This sequence shows how important Miles' connection to his new community will be to the story. And these themes are present throughout the entire game, showing just how much these people appreciate that this new Spider-Man is taking the time to meet their needs. We'll talk about this a lot over the entire video. The other major focus of this narrative is not only Miles learning the importance of community and embracing those closest to him, but also stepping up and gaining the confidence to be his own Spider-Man. To step out from Peter's shadow and use his great responsibility his way. But that also comes with the hard truths about being Spider-Man, that the work-life balance is difficult. Again, immediately shown in the opening sequence, as Miles has to bail on buying groceries for his mom to go help Peter make sure Rhino's prison convoy gets through the city safely. Even just this first mission has such a great narrative structure, with Miles' overzealousness to prevent Rhino's container from breaking loose, causing the entire chopper to crash down into the street. Miles and Pete basically have to do damage control to contain Rhino, and Miles struggles to keep up with Pete as they try to stop Rhino's rampage perfectly illustrates his lack of experience in comparison to Peter. Despite this, Miles saves countless people, and the longer the sequence goes on, the more comfortable he gets in the heat of these dire situations. And by the end, Pete is knocked out, and Miles actually saves the day himself, stopping Rhino with his newly discovered Venom Strike abilities. Miles, get out of here! Bro. Back the hell? <laughs> This entire first mission is Miles' trial by fire, and it's basically a perfect Spider-Man short film. Nothing comes easy for Miles, but he proves himself and doesn't run away when things get tough, even after making a major mistake. It specifically shows Peter that Miles is ready, even if he's still got some work to do, which is why he feels so comfortable leaving town and letting Miles fly solo. I screwed up today big time with the helicopter. But then you delivered big time. You saved my bacon, Miles. It's just a beautiful way to set the stage for the game, ending with Peter giving Miles his first real Spidey suit. But more importantly, it also sets the stage for the relationships that will flounder and flourish over the course of the game. One of my favorite sequences is this Christmas dinner, which both establishes all of the most important players in the game's story and gives us just a genuinely lovely dinner sequence. It gets us properly acquainted with Miles' relationship to both Ryo and Genki, both of which play key roles. I'm so glad that this game has really embraced Genki, though I think it made for a stronger film, Into the Spider-Verse's plan to utilize Genki were abandoned after Spider-Man Homecoming basically gave Ned Leeds the Genki treatment before Spider-Verse released. Across the Spider-Verse didn't really incorporate him back into the story much either, and while those films are amazing, it's just nice to see a key friendship in Miles' life properly explored in a big story like this one, and even impact the gameplay too. Genki is basically your point of contact. He created a Spider-Man app to help Miles track who needs help most, which is also just a genuine gameplay improvement as far as mission tracking goes. The dinner also drops hints about Miles' uncle Aaron and his mother's disapproval of Aaron, and then most importantly, it introduces us to Finn. Oh yeah, you guys won the middle school science fair at County, right? You made a, uh, energy, energy converter? converter? Jinx. <laughs> I think it's pretty understandable that Insomniac didn't want to burn any major characters in Spidey's rogues gallery for the shorter Miles adventure, so their solution was to adapt a character who was maybe a little underwhelming, for me at least. And I think adapting the Tinkerer into an entirely new character was really effective here. The Tinkerer is one of Spidey's oldest foes, and I have never been much of a fan. An old man who tinkers with stuff, neat. But flipping Phineas Mason into Finn Mason and tying those tinkering and scientific abilities to a younger character character, while making that a major aspect of her connection to Miles, is really smart storytelling. It's just more cleanly and intricately woven. I really appreciate that they didn't linger on Finn's villain identity either. Pretty much the first time we meet the Tinkerer, we learn that she's Finn. No need to draw it out. The important thing is that Miles' personal and superhero lives are at odds with each other. A perfectly Spider-Man dilemma. And this isn't the only changes and additions made to Miles' backstory and characterization. One major thing that happened for Miles as a character between Spider-Man PS4 and this this game was the release of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, and it would be disingenuous not to point out that the team at Insomniac definitely took a few cues from the success of that film. Out the gate, the game starts with a pretty banging soundtrack. They definitely used more outside tracks throughout the game's narrative than they did in the last game, and it's really effective here. It gives the game a hipper, younger vibe. Hard not to see this as Spider-Verse's influence creeping in, with that soundtrack being so prominent. On top of that, in this game, one of Miles' hobbies is making music, and it's actually partially how he connects with his uncle Aaron in one of the side 
side missions. Pretty easy to see how this is the insomniac version of Miles' street art as showcased in the Spider-Verse films. Both are artistic hobbies that Miles' comic book counterpart does not have, and in both instances he bonds with his uncle over them. But I don't actually mind seeing Spider-Verse's influence here. I think both this game and those films elevate Miles as a character in different ways, and it's cool to see some of the best versions of the character influence one another. While this game is more streamlined than the first, they still do a great job economically introducing important elements of the story. While Aaron was hinted at in the Christmas dinner sequence, we're actually introduced to him properly in one of the first solo missions. Miles helps him return power to the local train, an early mission that ties both to the game's themes of community and that important relationship. One year unlimited subway pass. Thanks. Did I get the name right? How did you... Aaron and Miles' relationship is definitely a highlight, both as nephew slash uncle and their street-level Spidey Prowler relationship. I'm really happy that this game also decided to make Aaron a more positive presence in Miles' life, like Spider-Verse did, a stark contrast to the comics. And I love that even in this first appearance, we can see that Aaron is repping a Rio Morales poster, still supporting his family despite the friction. Both of these Insomniac Spidey games have a wide array of collectible fetch missions across New York, but I think Aaron's sound mixing mission is easily the most impactful across either game. He encourages Miles to travel to different locations across the city to record specific noises to use in his beat mixing, but what makes them special is that for each sound, Aaron has a story about his life with Miles' dad before Miles was in the picture. It's a tragic but effective way for Miles to learn the details of how Aaron and Jeff's relationship fell apart and how much Aaron regrets that. There are key moments where Miles is betrayed by Aaron here, but his antagonism and attempts to stop Miles are only because he's scared of losing his nephew the way he lost his brother. Doesn't have to be like this. You, me, hating each other? That's how it happened between me and your dad. I don't want to repeat that. I don't either. But I can't be the person you want to turn me into. I can't turn my back when people need me. I have to be better than that. And again, it's another example of something these Insomniac games do so well. Almost every important conflict in these games ties back to relationships in Spider-Man's life. But as I mentioned before, the new angle in this game is Spider-Man's relationship to his specific community in Harlem. And man, do they make it feel alive. In an early mission at Rio's rally, you walk through the street fair with Genki. The lighting is vibrant and the neighborhood is brimming with life. These street level experiences do so much to make it feel like you're helping actual people, not random NPCs. In fact, the story is greatly enhanced if you choose to do the optional side missions. Every single side mission in this game is specifically community oriented. Early in the game, you help Teo at Teo's bodega after it was looted, who funny enough has a cat named Spider-Man. Not you, my cat named after the real Spider-Man. What's so great about this first side mission is how Teo is clearly a Spider-Man stan, but sees Miles as an imposter, not unlike a lot of fans of Spider-Man in the real world. But Miles actually wins Teo over by showing that he cares enough to help, by proving that he is a real Spider-Man. <gasps> Spider-Man! <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, good work, other Spider-Man. Thanks. Yeah. Of course. Miles helps the local feast chapter regain access to their building. Ah, oh, Spider-Man, you've got perfect timing. Don't know how much longer we would have held out. Thank you. In another side mission, you literally rescue the owner of Pana Fuerte from kidnappers, and then return all of these stolen goods back to these local businesses. You need food too. You're a growing boy. Mira, come by Pana Fuerte anytime. Appreciate it, both of you. Everyone on the block feels the same. Done as good, Spider-Man. In probably my favorite side mission, you help out Haley, a deaf street artist who appears countless times over the course of the game, in maid missions and side missions. After stopping some of Fisk's thugs from terrorizing a local park, Haley explains exactly what Spidey means to her and to the rest of the community. It's my home too. Honestly, if you beat this game without doing these side missions, you 
didn't get the full experience. They all focus so specifically on Miles' new home and the ways Spidey tangibly makes the community a better place for them. And it shows every single community member that you help show gratitude towards Spidey for his place in that community. It's a perfect distillation of what the Spider-Man experience should look like, and it even ties into the climax, but we'll get there soon. Okay, let's talk about Finn and her character journey here. I've actually seen a lot of criticism aimed at Finn, and I'm gonna be honest, I I think there are some pretty important aspects of her backstory that people seem unwilling to see or engage with. Finn's tragic backstory is that she witnessed her brother Rick die as they both tried to shut down Roxxon's new form energy program. Even worse, Simon Krieger watched and mocked them as it happened. No one's gonna care about a few sick people uptown or a dead engineer. It is a pretty brutal death and she saw it happen firsthand. Her only real family. Finn's response to this was to form a gang called the underground that is hellbent on stopping Roxxon by any means necessary. Looking at Simon Krieger, basically the stand-in for any evil, untouchable CEO, and the system that both put him in place and killed her brother, she did not see any way that he would properly face justice. She was radicalized out of helplessness and fear. But there's more to Finn's actions throughout this game than this backstory, and it once again ties back to those communal themes. When she was younger, Finn had her people, her support system, and those people were her brother and Miles. After Miles gets into Brooklyn Visions, they lose touch and they don't see each other nearly as much. Then she loses her brother tragically and suddenly Finn has no community. And the community she finds is the Underground, a group of people united by a cause and idea. They become her support system and her reason to keep going. After Miles discovers Finn's identity as the Tinkerer, he convinces her he wants to join the Underground so he can find the new form she stole. When she discovers that this was all a ruse and Miles reveals to her that he's actually Spider-Man, who the underground have been actively fighting, Finn feels deeply betrayed. I've seen a lot of criticism about this aspect of her story, because after this revelation, despite nearly reconciling, Finn berates Miles multiple times for lying to her. I want you to stop lying to me! I'm not gonna let you lie to me again! The issue with this criticism is that people aren't really reading into the nuances of Finn's backstory with Miles here. Finn is not just mad because Miles lied about wanting to join the underground, or that he didn't tell her he was Spider-Man. These lies are an extension of Finn's existing resentment towards Miles, and we learn the root of this in the flashback mission as they go to see their experiment at the museum. I'm gonna miss doing stuff like this with you. What are you talking about? Uh, hello? You'll be at Brooklyn Visions next week. I won't. I'm not gonna vanish off the planet. We'll still hang out. You'll be busy. Not that busy. I'm gonna make time for us. Seriously. Okay. Miles promises Finn that even though he got into Brooklyn Visions, he wouldn't lose touch with her. That he would make time for his best friend. And over the course of the story, it's made very clear that this did not happen. Through his new school, through the loss of his father, through the move, through Spider-Man training, Miles did not make time for Finn. Finn's resentment towards Miles is because she feels he lied about their friendship. He didn't keep his promise. And the moment she let him back into her life, she feels that he immediately began lying to her again. Despite their near reconciliation, Miles attacking Finn to save Rhino from her revenge-fueled attack was the last straw for her. Miles is the community that continually let her down. Instead of taking another chance on him, she falls back on the community that has been there for her, which happens to be this fringe terrorist organization. And let's be honest, this also mirrors how many people in real life end up feeling an obligation to fringe groups, conspiracists, cults, etc. They fall in so deep into these groups that it becomes far more about the community they gain than it does the actual belief system. Finn's plan to stop Roxxon is flawed. Roxxon will easily survive the underground attack and maybe even come out on top thanks to their insurance. Large corporations are rarely held accountable and they will ultimately end up being seen as the victim. Finn absolutely makes selfish decisions and major mistakes. She is 18 years old and stricken with grief and vengeance. She stops seeing how her actions harms others and starts only seeing her own goals because she thinks that's all she has left. Finn has lost everyone she cares about and feels like nobody is listening. She feels entirely abandoned and she refuses to give up on the goals that were built from that grief. Finn's character journey being so closely tied to losing the healthy community in her life and then turning to an unhealthy one is exactly why it's such a beautiful antithesis of Miles' own 
own journey. This entire story is about Miles finding his own way to be Spider-Man, and the way he does that is through embracing community, which is actually a little bit of a contrast to Peter. While the moment Peter gives Miles his first real Spidey suit is a beautiful mentor slash mentee milestone, the suit itself is a bit awkward. It's bunched up, ill-fitting, it still has knee pads for training, it lives in the shadow of Peter's suit, just like Miles lives in the shadow of Peter. And you can see this in the details. Early in the game when you swing, Miles flails wildly, he seems uncomfortable, but eventually Miles taps into his community and his loved ones. I said I'd fight for my home. I meant it. You could have died. Our family doesn't give up. You know that. The inspiration he draws from his mother and Genki helps fuel him to find his own way as Spider-Man. Whenever you say Spider-Man, you always mean the other one. You're Spider-Man. You can fix this. Your way. And once Miles reveals his new, properly fitting suit, you can see, simply by the way he swings, how much more comfortable and confident he is being himself. He's not trying to be Peter anymore, he is Spider-Man. In fact, Miles pretty blatantly ignores some of Peter's biggest Spidey advice, which is to keep his identity a complete secret. Again, Peter is a little more isolated. A couple people know his identity, but not many. Miles' identity ends up being revealed to Genki, Ryo, Finn, and even more people from his community later in the game, and when he finally reveals feels that he's Spider-Man to his mother, she sums up Miles' heroism perfectly. Miles, there is nothing you could ever do or ever be that would make me stop loving you. Nada. You give me strength, Miles. That's all a hero really is. Someone who's brave for the people they love. And Miles embracing community as a part of his identity as Spider-Man ties intrinsically to not only Finn's parallel journey, but to their history and relationship. One of the major collectible missions is finding these old time capsules that Miles and Finn left around the city. There are so many of them, each one giving more and more insight into how close they actually were. He regrets not maintaining his connection with Finn. He regrets not keeping that promise. He regrets not bolstering his community. And this time, he's going to do things differently. After Miles and Finn have their following out towards the end of the story, there's this really informative little scene between Miles and Genki. I, I wanted to say, thanks for always having my back, man. Miles isn't going to take this new community for granted. He wasn't there for Finn, and now she's on this revenge-driven path, which unbeknownst to her, happens to threaten all of Harlem, Miles' new community. The entire climax of the game gorgeously illustrates these themes as you help take on both Roxxon and Underground agents, protecting the actual community of Harlem that's basically in the crosshairs of these two awful militant groups. It's always about protecting the people. Finn is so far gone at this point, and so close to her goal, that she isn't remotely willing to hear Miles out until she actually sees evidence that what he's saying is true. And the moment this happens, she does realize she was wrong. And even more importantly, despite the chaos surrounding them, Miles still doesn't give up on her, saving her from falling to her death. <laughs> I think when it comes to this narrative, far too much of the discussion is on whether or not Finn is sympathetic or if her sacrifice at the end makes up for her mistakes. Of course, they don't make up for the mistakes, but both of these Spider-Man games have been about relationships. Miles did not do right by his friend after middle school and they drifted apart, and now he has to live wondering if things could have been different if he had been there for her. Finn's path, of course, isn't Miles' fault but he still let his friend down. And through what he learned over the course of this story, he sees how important it is not to let people slip through the cracks, to be there for them even if they've made mistakes. And Miles fully living that truth in this final showdown with Finn is exactly what showed her the kind of hero he is. Like Rio said, a hero is someone who is brave for the people they love. Despite everything Finn had done to Miles, he still risked himself to save her, and then was willing to risk himself further to save Harlem. And this is what inspired Finn to be a hero in her final moments. In fact, after the game ends, Miles has a phone call with his mom about this exact conflicting feeling, reconciling Finn's sacrifice with her mistakes, and I think Rio puts it best. You don't need to make a judgment on Finn's life, Miho. Or her death. Just remember who she was, and why you loved her. 
Finn is important because she's important to Miles. No, her sacrifice doesn't make up for what she did, but this all once again ties beautifully to the themes of community. If you show up for the people who are most important to you, those people will show up for you, which is once again perfectly showcased not just through Finn's sacrifice, but after it as well as Miles falls back down into Roxxon Plaza. All of the people who Miles helped over the course of this game, Ryo, Genki, and the community members from the side missions, they all show up for Miles when he's down because he showed up for them. Who is he? That guy? <sighs> he's our Spider-Man. After this sacrifice, after Miles shows up for the community and shows his uncle the importance of great responsibility, Aaron turns on Roxxon and Krieger goes to jail. Aaron has to serve time, but he does the right thing for his community, showing that while Miles and Finn had the same goals, there's a right and wrong way to go about it. This last scene of Miles in his neighborhood perfectly mirrors the first, but now he is with his people, and they have fully embraced him as both Miles and as Spider-Man. I think we can all learn something from what happened in Harlem. Together, we're stronger. And that having your own neighborhood Spider-Man is pretty great. Man, I just truly adore this game's narrative. It so beautifully builds up this version of Miles into his own hero through deep personal trials and tribulations. It's an absolute masterclass in theming, tying the importance of community to not just the story, but the major character journeys as well. It sets Miles' journey apart from Peter's and shows that there are different places to focus that great responsibility, and that by being a hero and showing up for those you love most, you can in turn inspire them to rise to that great responsibility themselves. And I have a feeling that Miles is really going to have to show up for those he cares about in Spider-Man 2, especially Peter. And I can't wait to experience that. Johnny! I stay mellow watching Johnny two cellos. He talks cartoons, he's a really cool fellow. He keeps you posted on adult cartoons. If that's what you're into, then grab a spoon and a very big bowl of your favorite cereal. Feels like Saturday morning cartoon material. Johnny two cellos, watch him on YouTube. Now enjoy this groove and bust a move.